Hello there. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to the Public Hygiene Council panel discussion. On behalf of the PHC, thank you very much for joining us today at this Facebook Live event. My name is Diana, sir. I am delighted to be here today. The Public Hygiene Council, or PHC, was formed in 2011 to promote good hygiene practices and to improve personal and public hygiene standards in Singapore. The Council, comprising representatives from multiple sectors, works to strengthen and coordinate community efforts to improve the cleanliness and hygiene standards in Singapore. It also complements the government's efforts in maintaining high standards of cleanliness and hygiene. Now, following the successful launch of Keep Clean Singapore 2021 and SG Clean Day in April this year, the Public Hygiene Council continues to celebrate its 10th anniversary with this inaugural Keep SG Clean panel discussion. This has also been organized to coincide with World Cleanup Day, which happens to be today. So, happy World Cleanup Day! Now, in the upcoming dialogue, our panelists will trailblaze into 2030, a truly clean city we can all be proud of. They will provide perspectives on how we can reduce our reliance on our army of cleaners, build a sustainable cleaning workforce, and ultimately achieve a truly clean Singapore together. We are also grateful that this event is supported by Kindred Community, a local chapter that champions World Cleanup Day in Singapore, the National Environment Agency, Steady Offshore Shipping Private Limited, and Tomasic Foundation. Well, with that, it is my pleasure to invite Chairman of the Public Hygiene Council, Mr. Edward De Silva, to deliver his welcome remarks. Chairman, please. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being here virtually. Is Singapore a truly clean city? Are we there yet? The pandemic has surfaced many fault lines and weaknesses, and some of them relate to public hygiene. With more people becoming highly aware of the importance of hygiene and cleanliness in today's climate, now is the time to change their attitudes towards littering. The Public Hygiene Council is glad to organize this panel discussion, which will focus on the state of Singapore's cleanliness and as we trailblaze into the future, how we can be proud of a truly clean Singapore. In celebration of Public Hygiene Council's 10th anniversary and at our annual Keep Clean Singapore campaign just a few months ago, I spoke about how each of us has a critical role in keeping our country clean. And this is a shared responsibility for all. The pandemic has heightened our collective awareness of the need for high standards of public cleanliness and hygiene. Many Singaporeans still expect more from the cleaners to ensure our vision of a clean city, and not just a clean one. But for high standards of cleanliness to be sustainable in the long run, all of us must start playing our part. We have with us today five esteemed panelists and a moderator, each with different expertise and background, but with one common goal. I'm excited to hear from them as they discuss the importance of inculcating the value of cleaning up after ourselves, and especially on how we can extend such habits and values to our youths as the future generation. Before I hand this time over, I would like to extend my gratitude and appreciation to Kindred Community for collaborating with Public Hygiene Council on World Cleanup Day. This event was also made possible by our sponsors, the National Environment Agency, Steady Offshore Shipping Private Limited, and the Masek Foundation. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you will enjoy the discussion ahead. Thank you, Chairman. I'm looking forward to deep dive into those points raised by the Chairman at the panel discussion later on. And now, to begin the dialogue, we are pleased to have Dr. Amy Kaur, Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Sustainability and the Environment, as well as Ministry of Transport. Dr. Kaur will deliver the opening address. Singapore has always aspired to build a clean, livable and enduring home for our people.
from the cleaning up of the Singapore River in the 1970s and 80s to the annual Keep Clean Singapore campaign. Our pursuit of high public hygiene and cleanliness standards has brought about a clean and safe living environment, as well as improved health and quality of life for everyone. This was made possible by adopting a multi-stakeholder approach and encouraging all sectors to play their part. First, premises managers in public and private sectors take ownership to upkeep their spaces and maintain high standards of cleanliness. Second, our professional cleaning industry enables and supports cleaning works required across settings. Third, individuals are encouraged to take personal responsibility for public hygiene and cleanliness through public education efforts. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the importance of ensuring high standards in public hygiene and cleanliness. In February last year, we launched the SG Clean movement to encourage social responsibility in keeping common public spaces clean to minimise the spread of diseases and safeguard public health. I'm heartened that more than 32,000 premises have now acquired the SG Clean quality mark. The mark demonstrates their commitment to maintaining high standards of environmental public hygiene. As awareness and expectations of public hygiene and cleanliness rise, there will be increased demand for quality cleaning services. Last year, we passed the Environmental Public Health Amendment Act, which requires premises managers to maintain baseline environmental sanitation standards. The new environmental sanitation regime was introduced in July this year to youth and elder care facilities and will be progressively expanded to cover more sectors. To enhance toilet cleanliness, the National Environment Agency, NEA, and the Singapore Food Agency have enhanced penalties for lapses in public toilet cleanliness since April 2020. Meeting these demands will require the environmental services industry, comprising cleaning, waste management and pest control service providers to develop new capabilities. With an ageing and shrinking workforce, we need to also transform the industry to improve productivity and make the jobs more attractive. To better guide this transition, NEA has launched the Environmental Services Industry Transformation Roadmap to outline 12 strategies and 33 initiatives to increase technology adoption and create higher value added jobs in the industry by 2025. The demand for higher cleaning standards, especially in food outlets, is reflected in the latest Public Cleanliness Satisfaction Survey findings by the Singapore Management University. The proportion of survey respondents who felt that cleaning in coffee shops need to be more thorough doubled from 16% in 2019 to 32% this year. The cleanliness of public toilets in coffee shops also registered the lowest satisfaction rate at 61% amongst all the premises surveyed. The NEA has introduced various initiatives to support operators in improving the maintenance of their premises. One example is the Toilet Improvement Programme, or TIP. Under this initiative, NEA will co-fund the cost of infrastructural improvements and redesign, deployment of technologies and adoption of productivity measures for more effective cleaning of public toilets. NEA has received applications for the TIP from 38 eligible coffee shops and 10 hawker centres so far. And I urge more to apply for the programme. NEA is also working with the Restroom Association of Singapore to raise cleanliness standards at selected locations through a systematic framework comprising audits, a checklist and training for cleaners. 
As mentioned earlier, keeping our public spaces clean requires everyone's collective efforts. In February this year, the NEA launched the Clean Tables campaign to encourage diners in public dining places such as hawker centres, coffee shops and food courts to return their used crockery and trays. To increase individual responsibility, enforcement against table littering was implemented in hawker centres on 1st September and will also be implemented at coffee shops and food courts from January 2022. So far, the response has been encouraging. Most diners returned their dirty crockery and trays and binned their litter after they finished their meals. Others did so when advised by our officers. Hawkers have provided feedback that the initiative has resulted in a cleaner environment. They observed that diners were also able to get a cleaner table more quickly as the turnover time for clean tables is now shorter. Bird encroachment issues at hawker centres have also improved significantly. I thank diners for cleaning up after themselves and hope that everyone who is able to do so will proactively return their trays and dirty crockery. I hope that over time, this habit of clearing our tables after eating at public dining places will become second nature to us. Keeping the table clean for the next diner is an act of graciousness to the diner. Remember, every time you dine at these public dining places, you are also the next diner. The act also shows care and consideration for the health and safety of others, including our cleaners. To complement these efforts, the Public Hygiene Council, PHC, has organised various activities to rally the community to do their part. Earlier this year, cleaners working in 17 town councils were given a day off on SG Clean Day in appreciation of their hard work and to encourage public reflection in the problem of littering in our estates. Some town councils organise their own litter picking activities and encourage residents to take ownership of cleaning up their neighbourhoods. PHC has also made organising cleanup and litter picking activities more accessible with the installation of clean pots as a community resource in our parks. Each clean pot is fully equipped with metal tongs and buckets for picking up and holding litter, as well as garden carts for transportation of tools and trash. I understand that PHC is expanding the network of clean pots and I hope that more members of the public will make use of this resource to organise your own clean-ups. Let me conclude. Keeping our environment clean is a responsibility shared by the government, premises managers and individuals. Over the last decade, PHC has strengthened and coordinated efforts among the different sectors to ground up efforts to improve cleanliness and hygiene standards in Singapore. I commend the PHC for these efforts. As the Council celebrates its 10th anniversary this year, I hope today's panel discussion will identify new ideas and opportunities for collaboration to create a clean, livable, sustainable and enduring home for all Singaporeans. I wish you a meaningful discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that. And now let's dive straight into today's panel discussion. I'm very pleased to invite my panelists to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Farah, and I am the co-founder of FITRI, and I'm also the mem a member of the National Youth Council. Hi, I'm Sam from Sustainable. Um, I also started the East Coast Beach Plan, where we encourage our volunteers to come down and keep East Coast Park clean. Hi, I'm Sandra Lim, Managing Director of Kanta Public. I like to take a human-centered approach that integrates behavioral science and data analytics to solve social issues. Hi, I'm Tan Eun I'm a sociologist and I teach at NUS. 
Uh, I also do research on uh, social inequality, ethnic relations, family and politics, and uh, more generally about social behaviour. Hello, my name is Tony. I am the president of EMAS, which is a collection of cleaning service providers in Singapore. Welcome all. And uh, my panelists today bring with them a, a lot of experience from a professional background. So I really would like to pick your brains today. Let's start by asking you, what to you does a truly clean Singapore mean? Farah. A uh, truly clean Singapore to me is something where uh, people actually genuinely and sincerely um, clean up after themselves and also are happy to, to um, you know, get everybody else to, to clean up together and I think that's when it's more um, you know it's, it's a collective effort so I think that's when we are truly clean. To me it's not about the streets being clean but a lot about how we embody cleanliness in our thoughts so meaning that everyone who lives in Singapore has a mindset of uh, respect for the environment and we do our own part to manage our own ways and clean up after ourselves. I think for me personally, being clean is about what you do in your daily lives. It's really like creating of a habit that you actually develop from very young. Um, that's really what clean society is or even creating a civic society. For me, I'm less concerned about uh, whether it's clean or not clean, right? I mean, what you see as manifested. I'm more interested in the motivation of people. Mm -hmm. I believe that everyone should be a cleanliness warrior uh, in, in and of themselves. And uh, so it is something that they will practice in their everyday life. Uh, it becomes a part of their life. So, so not so much about whether there's a cigarette butt somewhere, there's a dirt somewhere, but rather is everyone a warrior in, in this uh, uh, whole, whole project or whole campaign? My definition would be that uh, the city remains clean without having an army of cleaners cleaning after everybody. Okay, so, so from what I hear, there's uh, quite a bit of that thought of ownership and also a whole of society attitude towards cleanliness. And I think from what Samantha said, uh, cleanliness and sustainability and environmental protection, uh, it's, there are two things, two sides of the same coin. We can hardly separate that anymore. But we'll go a little bit deeper about that later on. Oh, I also want to share what is, uh, to me, a truly clean Singapore. And you can help me to count how many C's I have in there, okay? <laughs> so, citizens of Singapore are considerate of each other so that we clean up after ourselves and with a little help from our cleaners we can be truly clean as G. Five. Yay! Congratulations. <laughs> On self clap. Wow. Okay. Well, that, that's me anyway. Uh, we've also interviewed a few Singaporeans and let's take a look at what they have to say. I think town is clean because a lot of tourists come here. So I feel like there's a lot of effort put here to keep things clean. But in terms of like heartland areas and like HDB, that kind, I feel like it's not very clean. Because, I guess also because there's a lot of people that just throw rubbish la, yeah. when they lay out with their friend and whatever. I feel like there's a, there was a saying that was going around for a while about Singapore not being a clean country but a clean country, right? Oh yeah, yeah I guess. I think that was quite true. It's quite clean compared to other countries, but I think it, uh, there can still be some work done. Yes, in some areas, we feel that there's a lot of room for improvement, especially like at the void deck. There are some void decks in the same estate which are actually cleaner than another. If you say clean, is basically the void deck is mostly clean, only it's messy with, with stuff. Now, I think residents start to put stuff now in front of their, their home. So that creates that messiness in the area. But I think in terms of uh, Cleanliness. It's actually quite pretty clean. Uh, yes, generally it is a very clean country, uh, but of course it can always be improved. Uh, and I think everyone needs to play a part to keep the, the households clean, the environment clean, the hawker centers clean uh, ar around the streets as well. Singapore is a clean country and it can be cleaner if everyone does their part. I think cigarette butt littering is still a commonest problem in terms of the litter in Singapore. However, we need to start recognising that this problem is not just in Singapore, but it continues to prevail in many countries across the world. When we zoom out, actually, Singapore looks clean. But if we really look in detail, you know, into the beaches and parks and even the residential areas and heartland, 
Uh, I think there are many places where you can find you know, small pieces of trash you know, here and there. Right, so these Singaporeans have actually answered the question, my next question really, are we there yet? Uh, I think it's fair to us, for me to assume that most of you wouldn't agree that we are completely there yet. Can I do something fun? Just, up, just use one, using one hand. How many points in terms, five will be where we're there, one will be just barely got started. How many points would you give to Singapore today? Three, 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 four. Wow, Prof. Two. Okay, I must hear from the two extreme one. Tony, let's start with you. Why two? From what I can see, um, we do not have the civic consciousness to, to, to keep ourselves from littering, from dirtying the environment. And uh, even with the threat of enforcement, uh, we still see a lot of litter, a lot of trash, a lot of cigarette butts. So I, I do not think the culture has gone into us. Can I just ask the follow up on that? You say with the threat of enforcement. My question to the rest of you would be, does this mean that we step up enforcement? I, I would like to answer that. Um, I think we don't have, I mean, enforcement is one, is one thing, but I think that is also a signal of, of a moral stance on what we think about cleanliness is as a nation. And so having that kind of moral stance puts people into this idea that, okay, you know what, even if it's, so whether or not it's going to be uh, enforced or whether or not it's going to be, um, you know, ground up initiative, the, the idea is that everybody must know that it's actually important to be clean and to keep ourselves clean. So I think that's important there. Okay, so it has to be, to, to be coming from the individual uh, with a sense of ownership to the problem as well, if there still is one. Prof, you gave four points. Well, the reason I give four points is that I would say that by and large, uh, Singaporeans are quite law-abiding. Uh, maybe not as many of them are civic conscious, but certainly overall, I think we do follow the rules uh, that are uh, imposed on us. But at the same time, I think there'll be something like uh, maybe 1.5% of Singaporeans, and I'm referring to uh, a population of say 5.7 million, right? That adds up to about 80 over 1,000 people. Uh, even though the percentage is small, but the absolute numbers are actually quite large. And 80 over percent, as I see, is about twice the size of like, the population of Marine Parade. And so that is very large. And if every one of them were to be a uh, habitual uh, litter box, you can expect to see uh, littering around. But really, you know, the other 98.5% 90, 90, may actually be quite law-abiding and actually quite motivated and have a sense of ownership. Okay, okay, point taken. Um, we are talking about um, uh, uh, pe people who litter. You just need a very small proportion of people who do. And I think, Samantha, you had an experience last year uh, during the circuit breaker. Would you care to share with that? Yeah, I think, you know, places that are very public or they don't have a lot of enforcement, like you'd say, uh, there tends to be a big part of people that end up littering. And an example of that was at East Coast Park because everything was uh, on, on circuit breaker, so you can't go anywhere but to the recreational parks to exercise. My goodness, and we saw so many masks, um, some gloves, we saw lots of food packaging being left behind. Mm. So I think that was really a wake-up call for me and how badly littering is. And the worst part is that it's not possible to enforce the entire park. I mean, East Coast Park is more than 10 kilometers long. And we also had manpower shortages. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so give me some context. Uh, you were there during the circuit breaker last year. And were the cleaners doing their work? That's a favorite question that Singaporeans like to ask. Were the cleaners doing their work? Definitely, but also we had to acknowledge because of the migrant worker lockdowns, that put a huge strain. Um, so we also saw um, the cleaners are working 12 hours a day mm -hmm. from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Then there's also people that, the cleaners, they also clean 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. So it's a 24-hour cleaning shift, but we saw so much trash still piling up, despite, you know, the number of workers that were gradually increased. Okay, I see. The, 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 has what she has said, does it surprise any of you? You, you have witnessed it yourself, I mean. The, does that surprise any of you? I think as I said, right, you know, uh, you don't need a lot of people to be little bugs to create that kind of mess. And uh, on enforcement, uh, I think enforcement is necessary, right? But at the end of the day, what we need is pe are people who even when no one is looking at them, 
would still refrain from uh, litter, uh, littering. Okay. Um, uh, Samantha, I want to ask you, how many years have you been leading these beach cleanups? I've been doing cleanups on an ad hoc basis for, I mean, 10 years pretty much. We organize group cleanups, but because of COVID, you can't gather in more than groups of two to five, right? Mm. But that doesn't mean we just leave it for someone to clean up after us, no. So we encourage all the citizens to just in their own time, because they're going to the park to exercise, to just pick up a bit of trash and take it back with them. And I think the impact is so profound because we've started this initiative uh, for one year. And I can definitely say, you know, the situation has improved a lot. Oh, I was just going to ask you, over the 10 years that you have been doing the beach cleanups, have you seen any difference, for better or for worse? Unfortunately, I think worse. Um, I think, you know, it's uh, having grown up by the beach, I think the beach has gotten much more popular over the years. So I don't think it's a situation that I've seen improve over time. So nowadays, when you go out and you, given the heightened awareness of public standards of hygiene because we are in a pandemic, when you still see the kind of trash that you do, how does that make you feel? Alamak, like, why are we... <laughs> we are 2020. I always say, um, you know, Professor Siva has written a paper when I was born, which is in 1994, about the littering issue uh, and the, and the uh, marine trash that comes out to our shores. He said that things haven't changed. Um, you know, the data still shows that we are facing this problem two decades on. I feel sad when I hear this. And, and we have a saying in the newsroom, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But this just cannot be. But we, we, will, we will go on a little bit uh, about why you do what you do, and Farah as well, a little later in the program. Now, the Public Hygiene Council has previously gone to Taiwan for a study trip. Let us now take a look at a video from our archives on how events like marathons uh, contribute to littering. This video was taken during a PHC study trip to Taipei City pre-COVID. Let's take a look. You know, when I participate in runs, in the beginning of the race, the streets are beautiful. By the end of the marathon, have you noticed the amount of rubbish that's left behind? Just last month, I was running the Singapore Marathon. Uh, this is almost exactly the same scene. Uh, we are here to look at uh, how they organize the Taipei Marathon. If you notice the background, the whole place is quite clean, right? Uh, and later on, we're going to see how clean it is uh, during the run and after the run. The main is in Taiwan, which is the government of Taiwan, especially for the parents of the children's education, to make all the citizens and citizens 呃，本身体验，这是我们的国家啊，这是我们的环境，我们应该要呃保持它的一个环境度、干净度。Growing up, my mom always told me to clean up after myself, clear the rubbish, clean your bedroom. Now that I'm an adult, I look around my neighborhood, my community, I see all the trash and all the litter, and I ask myself, whose responsibility is it? I think we don't realize. How much negative effect we have on the environment when we choose to leave our rubbish around. Wow. Farah, what was the first word that came to your mind when you saw the empty streets of Taipei <laughs> after the marathon? I think a lot of people will agree with me on this. Uh, I think people just wowed by it, right? So I really just said wow when I saw that. Okay. Amazing. Sandra, you were also smiling away. What, what are your thoughts? I was like pretty sad, smiling because, oh my God, it's so embarrassing for us, right? I mean, we are a very developed market country for years, and yet we are still in terms of suffering this very hygiene issue. Why is this still happening? What's mm. wrong with people, mm. us, even myself, right? Yeah. Right, right. So, so it's so easy, and my response would be, what is wrong with us? And I say us because try, even when we try our best, I'm sure there are moments when we slip. But there is just too big of a difference between the two cities. I mean, even if we were to improve by 50%, it would still be better than nothing, right? So, so I think for me, that was, that was really astounding. Uh, Sandra, I know that PHC has commissioned Kantar to conduct a behavioral study on littering in Singapore. And the study is about at, uh, attitudes and behavior towards littering. Tell us more. 
So I think it's not surprising from what you actually see the video. It's exactly what we actually uncovered. Um, and the triggers in terms of why behave, people are behaving that way is a bit in terms of how they felt in terms of the environment. Um, so some of the triggers that came out was, oh, when they actually see that the bin is actually really full. Um, that's where they were like, oh, okay, since the bin is actually full, I can throw it anywhere that's near. Um, hence that creates an sort of littering issue that we have. Um, the other part that we actually uncover is the location of the bins. Um, when it's actually, where it is actually placed. Um, it's placed whether it's at your HTV void deck, your pathways, in terms of whether is it in the playgrounds or in the hawker centres. And what we found out was, of course, the more congregating areas, um, that's where they're most crowded. So it's not surprising where, when you look at areas as near um, hawker centres, food court areas, that's where a lot of leeches are actually, where you actually found most of it around. And, and, and if you look at, that's basic context, right? And just to really understand how behavioral science works, or even how brains work, um, context is very much affected by how people's mind works. So, so we always know, I mean, if you all read enough about behavioral science, there's always do these two thinking, right? System one, system two. So it talks about um, cautious mind and unconscious mind. So, so a lot of littering, especially the smaller that it is, it's very much a very unconscious mind, which is your system one. Um, so when you're really unconscious, like whether it's a cigarette butt, a tissue paper, uh, some small little paper that's flowing around, you don't even know that you have actually dropped it or you actually flicked it un unintentionally. Um, so that's what we actually meant by a very habitual thing. Uh, and people very unconsciously doesn't even know that they're behaving that way. Um, the other part that we also found out that why people are behaving on an unconscious manner is like social norming. Um, you also look at how people around you are performing. If your friends, your contacts, um, who is people that you're with, right, are behaving a certain way, you will also do it in the same way, right? So, oh, if I have a friend who's smoking and we just flick it. You know, sometimes it just gives you the image that I'm very cool, you look at me, you know what I mean? Um, it, it's sort of like a social standing and sometimes like, oh, if you actually really want to basically throw a can, um, or soda drink, but your friends are not doing it, then you don't want to be an outcast. Um, so the norming part is also really critical when you actually talk about why people are behaving in a certain way. So is it similar to the case of like um, that when you saw that, that whole uh, marathon, so when you see someone actually has thrown it to the side, I, I think it's okay for me to throw it to the side too. Exactly. So everybody has been doing it, right? Yeah. So you really need to have everybody behaving the same way, which talks about what I mentioned earlier. is the habitual part. It's the same as where you see the evidence from the Taiwan video, right? They basically educate from really young. Everybody do it the same way. And you see your children, your parents, even your grandparents behaving the same way. Then everybody will be actually having the same actions throughout as a society. But we are not like that in Singapore. And that's what we really need to self-reflect. Okay, so, so, so Prof, from a sociological studies point of view, what is your take on what Sandra has shared? Well, actually, I agree totally with uh, Sandra. Um, I mean, it has got a lot to do with the social aspects, right, which is the norms, the values. I, I, I would say that the values have to be something that's internalized when you're young or actually reinforced at all times, even in adulthood. Uh, but at the same time, there also should be uh, strong social norms to say that, you know, uh, littering is just, just not the way to go, you know, in this society. Uh, and uh, like what? Uh, but that message, that? I mean, yeah. that message has been repeated many, many times over the years, and also uh, together with the anti-littering law as well. So there are, I would say, that generally the norms are there. So why does littering still happen? Well, I think the norms is uh, is something that you observe in the in the context itself. So I, I would say that a, a general statement would be that cleanliness begets cleanliness. Mm -hmm. When you go somewhere and the place is clean, you tend to want to keep it clean. You know, one reason why, I mean, this is a, a bit straying out of the topic, right? A toilet, why are toilets dirty? And I think it's because it is dirty. And so you think, well, it's okay, you know, uh, everybody's doing it, so why not me, you know? So I, I would say that uh, really, if we keep the place clean, it will actually uh, result in other people also doing likewise, because that becomes the norm for that particular context. Like a virtual cycle. Yes, exactly. Okay, so I have a follow-up question about uh, the enforcement that has recently started with the trade returns. Can we use the law to so-called force new norms, new norms? Can that happen? Well, I think if people start doing it and then the place becomes clean, then I think cleanliness becomes the norm. 
right? So I would say so. Yes, it should be able to uh, have an effect uh, in terms of, uh, like I say, right? Cleanliness be getting cleanliness. Mm. What, what, what are your thoughts? The rest of you, what do you think? You can use the trade return as an example. Yeah. So, so for me personally, right, using enforcement is basically one of the action or one of the policy levers to actually really change a certain person's action to become a habit. That's what we're trying to develop. It will, of course, have very quick short-term effects. But we all know to become a habitual action, it takes time. So the, reaction, the, the reality is that we will need to see how effectively it really creates as a habitual. That it becomes an automatic reaction. Whenever you go to a hawker center, whenever you go to any public toilet, you will just repeat the same thing without even knowing. That's how powerful minds are. Then it will have worked. So the, the reality in terms of when you talk about all these social issues, right, is about the sustainability part, which is what Sam yes. actually shared earlier. When you actually created new norms, new habits will happen. And we never know what's going to have in terms of new contacts as well. And, and that's how it's actually the dynamics, right? It's never ending, I would say. Yeah. Well, personally, I think that, you know, even though the law is good in terms of nudging people in the right way, it only nudges in a certain context. Like what you mentioned, only in the hawker centre. So if I go to the hawker centre, I go to the toilet, then I will clear my tray. But what about like recreational parks? What about when I'm in nature? Is it do we expect ourselves to create a law for every single location in Singapore? Mm. And then do we have to even have more reinforcement measures, like having more um uh, more officers to observe for litter, litter people who like break the law? So I think in a way it's not as effective. I think it's a necessary move to have this law, but it doesn't solve the problem in the long run. Yeah. Prof, you, you were going to say something? Well, I think when you talk about enforcement, right, it doesn't have to be a cleanliness ambassador or the police or any of these law enforcement agency, right? I think enforcement, number one, of course, it could be self-policing. That means you police yourself. Uh, and over and above that, maybe there should also be people around you who are willing to be part of that policing process, you know. Uh, and, and maybe to just remind you, hey, you know, you just drop something, right? Uh, they don't have to be rude about it. They don't have to be uh, stopped by a condemnation, right? To say that hey, you are a sinner, right? But rather than say that maybe you have forgotten, why don't you just pick it up? Uh, so it is good to be reminded. So the social context in terms of the people around us also matter, right? Uh, and, and they enforce. So enforcement should be seen broadly, not just in terms of police or ambassador, but in terms of yourself and the people around you. Uh, the people around you may not be your friends, but just fellow park users, for example. Can I just ask you then, how do we draw the line between gently telling a, a, perf a perfect stranger that, hey, I think you dropped a tissue paper, to being a vigilante? How do you draw that line? Well, I think, I think it's a matter of attitude, right? Because when you remind somebody, you are actually, you know, you're, you're not out to get them arrested or get into trouble, right? You just want to remind them, that's all. Whereas I think the vigilante actually maybe hope that somebody, something will happen to them. So I think the attitude is really quite different, even though the, uh, the, the process, what appear, mm -hmm. appears similar. Right? If, I may, if I may... Yes, just, please, uh, Farah. Yeah. I would just like, just to bring an example of how um, it was like when I was studying in Korea, South Korea. Um, so it was mandatory for us to split our, uh, our waste into recycle bags, um, food waste, and then uh, other things. Um, and then when I talked, when I first found out about it, my um, my roommate who's Korean, she said, uh, "You're lucky in Singapore; you don't have to do that. We're mandated to do this." Um, and I was like, "Well, what's going to happen if you don't, right?" So they said, "She said, um, well, if you don't, then if I mix up all my trash and I put it outside at my." Um, trash bin, my neighborhood trash bin, the town council is going to come down to me and like, really call me out on it. Or even if they don't catch me, they're going to put a very passive aggressive message across to the whole neighborhood because you're now bringing down the value of the whole house, the whole mm -hmm. estate. So I think this kind of like policing that you were talking about, Prof, uh, is, is one of those things that I resonate with. I think like we actually can mm. be like, um, I mean, we don't have to be too, too aggressive about it, but actually even if it's mandated, it's actually the society that actually makes sure that things are um, in place. 
Yeah. Okay, so I'm particularly um, uh, interested in your concept, Prof, of everyone being a warrior against the littering, meaning that when we see something happening around us, we actually take a step further to remind someone. And I think during the pandemic, for us to pick up the other people's trash without gloves or without protection is maybe is a little bit uh, uh, risky as well. But to remind the other person that, you know, uh, you've dropped something. Does anyone have any experience? Because I need best practice. Someone tell me how to do this because I'm dead frightened. Because what if I get scolded? What if someone fills me on TV or on their handphone and say, ah, there you see this capo? So I don't know how to do it. How can I approach it? Does anyone have any experience? Uh, personally, I learned this from one of the volunteers we have at the East Coast Beach Plan. Uh, but I think because I'm a woman, I'm also a bit scared to confront maybe a group of people that I might be unfamiliar with. But she just taught me this, you know, if you see someone drop something, just pick it up, run after them and say, hey, sorry, you forgot this. And it just has such a positive tone. Mm -hmm. And I guess another way what we do as part of the East Coast Beach Plan is that we also don't really... Um, go after people, we just clean our litter. So sometimes, like, like, like what Sandra mentioned, right, the bin is already full, but people keep throwing stuff on the ground. We just pick it up because when we pick it up and we bag it, you know, people have the concept that, hey, a bit paise, like my own citizen is helping me clean my trash. You should have a paise plan. So, <laughs> like paise movement, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. No, it should be called, you not paise. Yeah. You not paise. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great, actually. Okay. You know, I remember there was a time when dog and pet owners had to be educated to clean up after their pets. And I think we seem to have moved along in that respect, which means that somehow we seem to be selective about what uh, we can do or what we want to do. Uh, back to the topic of reminding being warriors of anti-littering, uh, I'll share with you my own little story about uh, speaking up. Uh, but this, I'm not so, what's the word, altruistic because I was actually working out in the gym and there was a fellow gym user who was coughing. So at first, when the other person started coughing, I was like, no, are you coughing, dude? <laughs> right? And so I told myself, calm down, maybe it was just one cough. And when I counted seven times, I was like, should I say something? Because you are not feeling well. Should you really be here? Right? Because it was mask off in the gym. So the moment he got off, I, I, I said, excuse me, are you not feeling well? <laughs> I, it took so much courage for me to say that because I found it to be very confrontational. And I'll tell you what, his reaction really surprised me. He gave me a very broad smile and the first thing he said was, why, thank you for asking. Uh, I'm in fact very well, but I do have a habit of coughing a little bit, especially when I'm running very, very fast. Then he went on to introduce himself. I was like, Okay, it's not, I, I was like, come on, you want to fight? Yeah. Is it? <laughs> I was all ready for a battle, but, but he completely won me over and he was charming about it and positive about it, you know, and we ended up being friends. And that was a huge lesson for me. I'm like, okay, that's one way that I could do it as well. As long as you don't get defensive, maybe many things can be done. I think also you, you weren't very um, accusatory. I, I, actually, I was a bit like, are you sure you're okay? Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, from what I gathered, it's like you actually asked if he was okay. And that's a very genuine personal question to ask. Oh, I'm uh, so to make glad. To person feel yeah. more like, oh, okay, someone's paying attention to me. I need to be gracious about it. So I think that's an, a very kind approach that you had. Okay. Maybe, maybe we could... I mean, maybe it turned out... It, well, it did actually turn out better than I expected. Prof, you look like you're going to say something. Well, I think, of course, we should still be wise, you know, when we uh, in, uh, sort of confront <laughs> such people, right? I mean, if you think that the, the guy has all the tattoos and all that, you want to think twice, right, you know? Um, so, so it doesn't mean that we must go around policing everybody. Like, mm -hmm. But I would say that let's make it also a habit of uh, checking on other people. Uh, and... and in some contexts, it may not work, but in some, it does, you know. So we don't have, we, I mean, it's not our responsibility to make sure that everybody conform. Uh, but we do our part. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to add on because you also, you know, check and ask about how someone is doing, right? Like, you know, cleaners are also people, right? And, and I think that was one part for me. When we are a bit, you know, younger, you know, uh, you hear things like, you know, don't uh, make sure you do homework. If not, you end up 
like them. And I think that is really unfortunate mindset that we've cultivated. Mm. But we need to be kinder even to our cleaners because they are like the backbone of our industry. So I just wanted to say that, you know, when we talk about being kind, it's not just to people around us, but also um, our cleaners, people who help us grow this uh, society. Tony. Um, well, I, I, I guess the guy in the gym had an explanation for his cough, but uh, the guy who drops his tissue paper probably don't have an excuse. Mm. But, but I, I, I do believe that, uh, I hope rather that um, this latest nudge uh, uh, about tray return will, will ingrain into our DNA. Mm. And uh, I, 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 I say, I use, I use the word hope because we have this anti-littering law for decades. And, but it is still the status quo. So, Tony, so, you, you sound like you are long-suffering. And I mean, <laughs> I mean that in the best possible way, if it's even possible. You sound like you are long-suffering. And more importantly, you don't sound like you are optimistic moving forward. I, I wouldn't say that. I, I'm just hoping that the latest nudge will actually spur everybody to think the right way. What I feel is that we, we need a critical mass. Out of ten, five, at least five need to think in a certain way then the rest will follow. Don't we have that, Sandra, Prof? Out of 10 people, we don't, 10 people, we don't have five people who say, I take ownership of the environment. What are your thoughts, Sandra? Well, yeah. So I think people claim that they actually take ownership. But I guess, again, right, the context comes in very important. Ownership, if it's actually around the place that they live, um, it affects in terms of the environment directly. I think that's why you see the cleanliness being the best situation. However, if it's at a public location where they only frequently or occasionally actually only visit, I think that's where you can see, that's where littering or cleanliness is a very, very big issue. So, so the self-interest part or how it affects me uh, or in a way, what's in it for me to be doing something it's actually really important. I mean, that's, that's very practical. Every single one is about why, why, why do I need to actually remind someone? There's nothing in it for you. So, so we, let's think about, in terms of what you talk about, right? The, the picking out of your dog's poo example. Um, it took a while and it has actually really worked. And, and the reason why, because like, I mean, I remember my neighborhood, right? We do actually look at people and remind them if they do not pick up because it is my running track. It is my walking track, my exercise. If they don't pick it up, I'll be the one actually stepping on it. <laughs> See, that's, where, that's where you will start thinking, right? Then you will very automatically remind the person to do that particular action. So you will always need to consider why... So, so there are also certain ways, right? Anyway, when you talk about reminding, I guess there are very subtle ways is, of course, you can just gently remind. But don't... I think we also need to also remember that there's our facial expression is also very good at actually reminding people without speaking. Yeah, exactly. Because it might be a very good way instead of, if we are very worried that it might offend people with the tonality of us speaking, maybe use our action. How, how, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> that, that looks like Farah. <laughs> okay, okay, post on Farah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Farah, how like that? Oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Apa <laughs> like that? Is it? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I, I would do that with my family and friends, but, but I realized that, you know, and that's where the tray return ambassador. So, so for, for my program, I've gone as an undercover, as a cleaner before, and recently I did a stint as a tray return ambassador. I was far more frightened to be the tray return ambassador because I think for me it's the fear of confrontation. So, 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 but th this issue is up in the air. As a matter of fact, uh, those of you who are watching, what do you think? Uh, how, how can do you have any ideas on, or best practices on how we can remind people around us to nicely, politely pick up after themselves? Okay. Um, Tony, I want to get back to you. You know what Samantha said earlier on about how when you were young, people said, hey, you don't study, huh? you go and sweep the floor. Why did you choose the cleaning and waste management industry? Well, uh, it wasn't a choice for me. It was... Uh a direction that my, my company took uh, to acquire uh, a cleaning and waste management company. So, well, that's where my job, to, job took me to. So, it wasn't my desire to, to join a cleaning company. Okay. And how many years have you been in this business? 21. 21 years. What is the most satisfying thing being in this business? I think uh, to really maintain a premise 
very well with a good team of staff uh, to the satisfaction of the client and to patrons and users, that is very satisfying. Okay, so I was reading the story about uh, Rwanda. I think some of you may know Kigali. Uh, Kigali is a very clean place uh, and they have these ground up community cleanups on a very regular basis. What I was surprised a little bit is their cleaners are mainly female, mostly female, and these cleaners feel that cleaning is not a job. It is almost like, uh, what is the word? It is their duty to, their honour to keep their city clean. I was a little bit taken aback because it's the complete opposite of what we kind of grew up with. Do you think that this is a place where you hope cleaners in general, the waste management industry in Singapore will go towards? There will be nirvana, but I don't know <laughs> there. <laughs> One day lah, huh? One day, okay. We hope, we hope, we keep hoping, we hope, we keep trying. Yes, yes, that's true. We have to keep uh, uh, trying, not just hoping. Okay, let me just um, uh, get... Uh, okay, I, I, uh, earlier on, uh, Sandra, you had mentioned that your survey said that most people feel that when the bin is full, then they will just leave it there. So maybe it's very timely for us to address a couple of myths and misconceptions at this point, okay? So one of the things that Sandra mentioned was putting rubbish around or near a full bin does it constitute littering? Sandra? The answer is yes. It's not inside the bin, so it is considered as litter. Oh my goodness. So technically speaking, if there is an enforcement officer around, I can get fined $300 for putting my pair of old shoes next to the bin, even though the bin is full. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Find the next bin. Huh? Oh, the okay, next okay, okay. bin. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 a lot of money at East Coast. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, sell the second-hand items after you've picked up. Okay, so the solution to that, good point. So we debunk that, and the solution to that is to find the next bin. Okay. Go on to your trash until you see it available of the bin. Yeah, Yeah. I, I know it's not easy because so often I have my kids saying, Mommy, I finished already. So hold on to it. Lah. Then 20 seconds later, Mommy, I finished already. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you hold on to it. Lah. Because she's hoping that I would take it from her. Right? I said, well, you just have to hold on to it until we find a bin. You can't just leave it there. But, so, I know that it's not easy. That's misconception number one. Now, misconception number two. If the wind blows away my tissue paper or plastic wrapper or whatever it is, it's not my problem. Did it come from you? Huh? Did the plastic come from you? <laughs> You're very technical. You dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm at the hawker centre, okay? Yeah. Okay, maybe at the beach, to use uh, Samantha's example. I unwrap my, my plastic straw, which I shouldn't be using in the first place, but let's say uh, disposable chopsticks, okay? And then the plastic flew away and I didn't know it. Confirm lah. <laughs> so confirm, okay, okay the confirm kind of, actually the question should be, it flew away and I saw and I'm like, okay, so it flew away, it's not my fault, it's the wind's fault. <laughs> No, it's still your responsibility because you're the source of the creator. Yes. The litter came from you. <laughs> okay. It, it is our responsibility, but I think according to the law, it is our trash. So this is what I've learned from uh, uh, my work at the Hawker Centre, and that is if it flies off from the table, it's yours. So it is actually enforceable, right? Does that mean that there's limitations to law? Then? Like, I think at the end of the day, it's not about the law being present or not. It's about you being having that sense of responsibility over whatever things that you have around you, right? Uh, and whether or not you care enough to do something about it. So I think law actually is part of the solution and it's not exactly like an all, you know, solving. It yeah. All, yeah. Prof, from, from, from your I, research. I, I think if you are a cleanliness warrior, as I advocated, right, you will not be looking for loopholes. You know, whether you fly with your hand, plastic, or whatever, right? I mean, dirt is dirt, litter is litter, right? You pick it up. Even when it's other people's litter, in fact, sometimes, if you can help it, you should also pick it up, you know? Uh, and that may actually teach the person who litter a lesson. Uh, so, anyway, my point here is that uh, it's not about looking for loopholes. Because if you look hard enough, you probably can find one. Uh, and, and, and use that as an excuse. But I, I think that doesn't do anything for our, our city, right? I mean, if we love our city, we want it to be clean, we will not be looking for excuses to, uh, to litter. 
I wanted to jump on because you mentioned about making excuses, right? So I actually advocate and always highlight to people that litter is a really big issue in our country. And the biggest myth, uh, or everyone always tells me, huh, but it's not ours, what? Like all the litter we see on the beach is actually like from other countries. And I think that's one of the biggest myths. Of course, you mentioned, right, if there are 85,000 people of, um, or even though it's a small part of our population, they always litter, it really piles up. And I can guarantee you, if you go to like Parkland Green, um, you know, where some fast food restaurants are, you'll always see the same type of litter everywhere. And you can actually pick it up from the beach. So, you know, that's one of the myths I really wanted to debunk because I think it also deflects very important conversation about our attitudes and behaviours. So what you are saying is that it is, in fact, our trash. Uh, we are, in fact, responsible for the dirty beaches, for example. There's only this much that you can blame other people for the problem. Yeah, exactly. Because when people think about beach, they forget about the, the green parts, the park the part where a lot of people actually cycle and run. So that's a big part where, you know, a lot of the left behind packaging comes up. Like you mentioned the chopstick and the plastic bag, right? There was one time I walked 50 meters off East Coast Lagoon. I picked up 250 of the plastic wraps in, um, in less than one hour. So it's a very big problem and it's very small. So sometimes it's hard for people to see. Mm. And I've actually seen like authors roll in this kind of trash and eat it because it's, it's kind of in their way. So yeah. So I'm going to close off this segment with one question, and that is where we are today. Does it mean that all the campaigns and public education have failed? Prof. I wouldn't put it that way. I think we should see things holistically, right? Uh, it's not one campaign or it's not one uh, enforcement or whatever, right? Uh, all these will raise awareness, uh, and therefore it is still useful. Uh, I mean, we can't look at just one, one campaign and say it's not working because uh, who knows what the uh, uh, effect actually is, right? So we, so we need a multi-modes, right? Not just one mode, you know? And so everything we have to do. So maybe I can add on, right, to what Prof has actually said um, and totally agree. We shouldn't say that it has not worked. I think it has worked for its own means and what it was supposed to do in the past. But for really effective in terms of behaviour changes to work, you need multiple ways. So we call it various type of levers that you have to work in conjunction and holistically together. Um, so a couple of examples that we have actually quoted. Um, if for example, in terms of littering or any trade return or any particular other behaviours that you want to change, you need to have the right infrastructure design. Okay? coupled with the proper education. At the same time, in terms of also having in terms of um, the right incentive. That's something that's attractive. What's in it for you? Why do you need to do it? Enforcement is definitely the last way to go with. And if you really need to include that, it needs to be coupled with others. It can't be just enforcement alone making it work or just education alone making it work. It has to be coupled with multiple ways and techniques together, you will actually be more effective. I think policy also plays a big part because we talk about bans, we talk about um, education, but we also need to look at upstream policies. So maybe looking at certain types of litter that we feel are not essential in society. For example, maybe, sorry, I'll get shot for this styrofoam packaging. Are there alternatives that can be leveraged to also reduce the risk of littering? Mm -hmm. um, so I think all these kind of policies and handled methods will push us to maybe 90%. But the 10% is always the hardest, the 10% remaining of how do we keep that consciousness with us and make sure that it passes on to the next generation. I think that is really the true challenge that we know we are going to face. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Sandra, you would add something? Yeah, and actually to add on to that, right, I think what's also very important is also to refresh constantly refresh the ways that we do things because there's always new generations new thinking that's actually coming out you can't just be stuck with the ways that oh things have worked five years ago it will still work today it won't because new habits will develop new cultures will be there new ages and, and they're exposed to new power new, new ways right for other countries so you have to constantly refresh the thing and how it's relevant for the different target audience that you're looking at yeah i think for that reason we need to start them young the, the earlier we start them on this uh, uh, habit, you know, cleanliness habit, the better. And, uh, and, and it's not just about doing it in school or any other places, but it should be reinforced in all places, whether it be in school, at home or other, other, other contexts.
Okay, so we'll look, about, uh, we'll look into education a little bit later on, but for now, let's listen to what some other Singaporeans have to say. Um, I guess we Singaporeans live with laws, so we need a little bit of a push factor, all right, to make us do things, and I think it's a good idea to keep Singapore clean, both from a public health point of view, as well as to help the younger generation to do what is right. Yeah, common sense. Uh. After you eat, you should return the tray. Uh. But then again, at most hawker, right, the tray returns area are normally like packed. Uh. And sometimes there isn't enough space to return the trays. Uh. I think that Singaporeans are trying their best to keep their environment clean. But there are some people, they are like more like rude. And like they won't bother to like throw the rubbish um, in their rubbish bin. If they can't find a rubbish bin in the middle of the streets and they're far from a rubbish bin, they will probably just like see if anyone is looking around and just litter on the floor. And I personally think that that's a very like bad thing to do because why not just keep the rubbish in your pocket for a while or just hold it a little longer and like, just find for a rubbish bin. In articulating this, our vision of Geng Mei Hao the which is a, 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 a more beautiful, a cleaner city. Uh, inside the boxes, there were also quite a lot of young people commenting about uh, keeping the country clean. What, in general, are young people's attitudes towards this? Farah? Um, I'm not too sure myself, but because I might be the older generation of youths, <laughs> uh, one of those geriatric youths, right? Uh, but I do see how the younger generation are a bit more woke or aware of the, uh, the surrounding systems, um, power. I think they are aware of the, the, the way that things work rather than just see on things on the surface. And I think they know how to investigate. So I think with this kind of like awareness of uh, things, they are able to find answers quite quickly. And I think when we, do, uh, when we talk about cleanliness, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually say that. I actually know that in other countries, it's much easier to... I mean, a country like Taiwan is actually more clean than Singapore. And Singapore is, the, is a cleaned city rather than a clean uh, city. Yeah. Mm. Sir? The word art, process, educate from young really bothers me because I'm seeing all these young people, they recognize that it's a big problem. But yet at the same time, you know, there has to be somewhere down this track where, you know, the mindset shifts and the ah, yeah, I don't care anymore. Mm. Because, you know, when we do all these cleanups, it's always the young people. And, you know, some people I've also seen on social media, people can be quite savage. They can say, like, okay, I'll just litter so that these young ones can pick up after me. Um, so I'm starting to think, you know, there must be a shift where we just have a nonchalance towards this little issue. And it's quite a pity because we do educate them from young, but then where does this mindfulness go in the end? Yeah. Well, Prof, is there any research that, that, that advises us what happened along the way? Well, I've not done any research on this, right? But I would say that logically speaking, right, all this has to be reinforced. You know, one of the words that we have been using quite a lot is work in progress, right? So I guess mm -hmm. we are still always in the work in progress kind of mode. Uh, it has to be re reinforced everywhere. Uh, so to the extent that it becomes second nature, right, or what we call habits. Uh, and, and I think there should be no let off, you know, until we get there. So yeah. in the meantime, let's continue to reinforce it, whether on ourselves, mm. on the people around us, and of course more broadly in terms of the uh, law enforcement agency, right? Farah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, clearly there needs to be a study on how uh, the youths behave. Uh, we don't have enough data to understand their motivations, their, um, the things that will you know, make them do something different. Um, is it about reinforcement or is it about um, you know, rec recognising that they need to be nudged in a different way than how we have been doing that? So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I would take personal responsibility in trying to find out myself, like how do I youths um, you know, get there? Yeah, and, and, and also what do they want? Because we won't be here forever. So what kind of Singapore or future Singapore do these youths want? Because only when you know what you want, then can we work towards that, right? Prof, you were going to say something. Well, I, I think we all know what they want, right? I mean, we, are, we always aspire to, for something good. But the question here is whether do they see it as something that they are personally responsible I think what happened is that whenever you told, tell people that you know everybody should be responsible, right? You ended up nobody responsible. <laughs> you know what I mean, because it's everybody. You know who, who are you talking about, mm. right? Uh, 
Uh, so so there got to be a, a ingrained in people a sense of ownership that okay, I mean, whether others are doing or not, that's, that's beside the point in a way. But I must do it. Okay, it is my personal responsibility, right? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's something that we have to just keep reinforcing, uh, keep incentivizing, mm -hmm. and uh, or maybe we should even try to uh, affirm one another, right? In other words, if somebody does a good job, let's affirm. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be always about punishment. Mm -hmm. It can be about affirming people who are doing it right. Can I show a different perspective? Yes. Because you know when we talk about littering, we are always talking about the environment. But I think it's a very, very social aspect as well. For me, because you mentioned like what keeps us going, right? For me, like, I know if I pick litter, I'm going to pick litter for the rest of my life until I'm, I'm probably old and there still will be litter. But to me, it's also that social aspect. Uh, what I realized, you know, why our community does it is because it's also providing a better livelihood for our cleaners. And I say this example because um, when I was at the beach cleaning last year, there was so much trash that was collecting water that I actually caught dengue from mosquitoes breeding. And as I spoke to some of the cleaners as well, they mentioned that, you know, it's really crazy because uh, when they clean the beach, they clean the parks, there's sand flies, there's dengue, a lot of them fall sick and their biggest fear is falling sick because they cannot work. So it's also that social aspect that's so important because you know that you are so not only creating a better uh, environment for your otters and your turtles, you're also making someone's job a bit easier and a bit better. Uh, so, so, I, think, so, I think the problem is that the uh, consequences of littering uh, is not very direct and very obvious, right? Yeah. You can talk about cleaner environment, dengue and all that, right? But the person will not see it, right? As I'm causing dengue. The person just don't see anything. You know? So, so, so uh, what, what is the problem? Because the streets are cleaned the, the next day that you come. So therefore, you do not see the consequences of your own littering actions. Tony, I see you nodding. Yes, I, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, the next future generation will, will treat cleaning services uh, as an outsourced service. Just like how they would subscribe to maybe a Netflix account. So yeah, they want the environment to be clean, but they're not doing it. But what is the problem with that? I, I feel, again, it's about values. They do, they it is about? Values. Okay. Values. I, um, they do not have this personal belief that taking care of the environment is their personal responsibility. So let me tell you this. I was, doing a, I was going around hawker centres doing uh, interviews the other day, and someone told me that I do not think we should let our elderly clean our tables. We should only outsource and hire foreigners to do it, right? So what are your thoughts about that? Because it's related, that's just an example, but it's related to the question, yeah, if young people think that, but so far we have done really well huh, with 59,000 cleaners, so why not continue to up it, double the number? I can afford it. What's wrong with that? The government has uh, some prerogatives about foreign workers, so we are limited to the number of a percentage of foreign workers that we can have. And, and the fact is that uh, we need to keep a Singapore core uh, workforce. Right? We, we need to be self-capable, we need to have our own local workers to look after our own work. And are you getting enough locals who want to work in your industry? Sadly, no. Uh, just to uh, correct you, um, I, I do not think we have 59,000 cleaners now. I think that number came from a few years ago. The, the number that we saw recently was 55,000. So we lost about 8-9% of cleaners. There are many reasons for that. Attrition due to retirement, health, even death. So, and, and there is no new influx of cleaners because of the changing demographics, education level has gone up. Nobody wants to be a cleaner. Okay. Can I share my experience? Because um, I did meet and got to know some cleaners uh, in as part of cleaning and volunteering at the beach. So there was this uh, friend, I call him a friend of mine because we used to communicate and he'll tell me how dirty the beach is. Uh, his name is Ren Ming. So he's from China and he actually, you know, has been working to clean Singapore's beaches for almost, I think, eight years. So he will do work six days a week. He'll work from 12 to 12. Okay, not 12, 12 hours. So he wake up at 5 a.m. and he gets back home at 7 p.m. So uh, my friend Yasa and I, we had dinner with him and he shared with us that, you know, no one sees the hard work that goes into it. it like what he mentioned, you know, there's attrition. I'm not surprised. It's a thankless, very tiring, laborious job. So I, I think at the same time, we also need to acknowledge that we can't keep sustaining this forever because if one person picks up all their trash, then we wouldn't need so many people to pick up everyone else's trash. So that's just kind of... um 
my thoughts on this issue. Yeah, I think the day we change and we tell our children, if you want to be a cleaner, go right ahead. <laughs> that is the day that we can say we can hire any number of cleaners that we, we want, isn't it? So I want to get back to uh, Farah as well as um, uh, Samantha about why you do what you do. So Samantha, since you've shared with us already the satisfaction that you get from doing what you do, what are your parents' reactions when you say that, Mom, I'm going to make a living from picking up rubbish from the beaches? I think I'm quite lucky because my parents are like super supportive. Like when they see me cleaning the beaches, they're like, oh yeah, you go lah, but I'm not going to join you. Um, so in a way that, you know, I think that kind of support from your parents is really important. Acknowledgement that you're not wasting your time at the beach when you could be maybe doing something better else in their mind. So I think parents really need to be very encouraging to that. Um, and I think it also goes to the rat race, right? Because I graduated a few years ago, it's the same thing. Go get a corporate job, you know, go be a doctor, lawyer, whatever. And anything else you do is not worth that time. So I think also, you know, parents need to encourage doing activities. It's like, you know, you send your kids for CCAs to go and have so many tuition, right? What's the purpose of that? Are there any other activities that are equally as enriching, like volunteering? Which I do start to see a lot more. Okay. Farah, tell us what it is that you do and why you do it. Right, so a few years ago, maybe in 2014, uh, I started the Repair Kopitiam movement, which is essentially a program where people will come down with items, um, mostly electronics or electrical items, uh, to get it repaired. So they will re learn how to repair and they will repair it themselves. I think what I learned from that whole process, and it's still ongoing until now, it's just I'm not running it anymore, is that people come down with different motivations and that people actually do things quite Mm, without actually thinking that it's good for the environment, uh, without that being the main motivation to get them into doing it. I think fundamentally what they wanted to do was just to, um, you know, for nostalgic reasons, save the product, save the thing that actually was my gift from my wedding, for example. Um, and that it was very interesting for me to see like the shift uh, in the behavior because something was uh, done, it was done uh, every last Sunday of the month. It was consistent in the same neighborhood. So it became like a regular community thing. Um, and I can see that if this, is, if this continues in the long run, then we can see a very seamless uh, behavior of uh, a behavior change. So it will be like one fine day, it will just be, um, okay, it's the last Sunday of the month, it's repair day. So I can imagine that in doing uh, cleaning, um, lit litter picking and whatnot, it will actually become one of those, oh, we just do it because we just do it. Yeah. So, so, so this is something which uh, uh, PHC, the Public Hygiene Council, has been doing. As part of its annual Keep Clean Singapore campaign, PHC has introduced the SG Clean Day. Now, that's where the town councils will stop cleaning public areas, sweeping uh, open areas and ground levels of housing estates for a day. This initiative is uh, to show how much litter there is and there can be if there is no cleaners around to pick up after us. Residents were then encouraged to volunteer picking up litter around their neighbourhoods in small groups of eight. The longer term plan for the town council is actually to conduct SG Clean Day every quarter of the year and then once every month in 2022. Uh, to quote Prof Tan, or many Singaporeans, this is a work in progress. <laughs> but, but we are taking baby steps towards that. The PHC is in talks with the town councils to help to make this happen. So, jia <laughs> Okay. Okay, actually, um, I want to, uh, Prof, we've been talking a lot. Are there any other cultural factors that we haven't mentioned that stop us from getting to be a truly clean city? I, I would say that you know, a lot has to do with socialization and internalizing the values. You see. I don't think there's any impediment. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, would, I, I would believe, I would argue that you know, most of us do believe in cleanliness uh, and that cleanliness is a good thing. Uh, the problem is whether you actually practice it. You see. So I, I would say that at the values level, it is there. But it's at the practice level that is one thing uh, for, for a segment of the population. So. So I think the point here is to reach out to them and, and try to convert them, you know, to, to what, is, uh, uh, what they ought to do and yeah. become a, a sort of second nature. Yeah, I, I think the challenge is during the pandemic, personal hygiene standards have increased tremendously because it's very clear, none of us want to get COVID. So the threat is very, very real. Now, the big challenge really is to uh, how do we then extend that from personal hygiene to public hygiene? 
isn't it? So that's a big question, Samantha. Yes, I wanted to bring a touchy topic because you talk about cultural, right? One thing I noticed is that, you know, every seven months, the Hungry Ghost Month, that just, you know, is really a very challenging hard for me to understand because, you know, people will leave their offerings there and, and then, you know, one month later, it's like, whose responsibility is it, you know, even um, the contractors who are hired to keep the place clean, you know, unsure because they're not sure if it's any sensitive uh, religious or cultural matters. And actually last month, there was this video at East Coast Park. This guy dumped two, one whole box of offerings into the canal. And the next day, the whole canal was completely littered. And that's the exact canal where all the East Coast authors live. Mm. So to me, it's like I, I, I struggle because I'm not sure how to address it from a cultural perspective. So I love to hear, you know, uh, I guess everyone's thoughts here on, on the Hungry Ghost Month. <laughs> wow, Prof. Well, I, I think this is about religious practices. So we've got to be a bit more careful. I think what I'll do is I'll try to understand why people do not want to use the receptacle provided for them. Is there anything religious about it that they have to burn in the open? You know, maybe that they... So, so, so I, th I think you, I, I wouldn't want to question about uh, other people's religious practices, for example, but I do have a curiosity, Tony. I mean, Samantha just brought up the point, right? If the offerings are left by the side of the road, which is very visible during the Ghost Festival, what is the instruction to the cleaner? Um, we will not clear it immediately. Uh, okay. It will be left there for probably until the next day before we clear it. I we see. will still clear it. So the, the, the cleaners are actually will clean it? La. Yes. Okay, okay, got it. Right, so um, we have talked about that. Ah, yes. Speaking of uh, cultural factors, I mean, you know, cultural factors, again, is one of those things that's kind of like in the air. It's very hard to put a, a finger on it. But there are things that we can do infrastructurally to make people, uh, to, to make it easier for them to bin their rubbish. Service design is one of them. Uh, and I think, Sandra, you are also an expert on service design. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more by, for example, about tweaking little things to make it, uh, to incentivize people to bin our trash. So, so on trash, I think some of the ideas that actually globally has actually worked well is about the attractiveness of the beans, right? So I think we talk about the fullness of the beans. So as long as we assume and make sure that beans are always um, half full at least, uh, and that creates a cost of more um, second, we talk about location. So it's not about having more beans, it's about having beans at the prime area where it's actually really, really crowded. Um, and that's basically using infrastructure to solve the problem, which is what service design is about. Um, so that, that, that is actually two of the things from the results that we can change. Um, of course, in addition, the third one is about the attractiveness of the design of the beans. Um, so there has been a lot of um, pictures and, and behavioral science work that you have actually seen before. Some where they, for secret buds, they use um, the beam polling system um, to actually see who you're voting for as a gamification. And it has actually worked well. Uh, some have actually made the beans really attractive, like scary monsters um, or mascot figures that you look forward to actually go and bean. Um, then even having footsteps, right, where you can even find the location of the beans. Um, so this is what we meant by using infrastructure, infrastructure or actually design to actually help. Um, but one of the ones that I really see more significantly in terms of successful use of service design is really um, where you see like, like, I mean around us, right, trolleys in supermarkets. You can see that it's the same mechanism, right? You use a dollar, which at, regardless of whichever brand or supermarkets you go, it is the same way you retrieve a trolley, you return a trolley. It becomes very automatic. I don't even need to know hey, which, which supermarket I'm at to know how to do it. Um, so this is the same system. It's creating consistency in a, in a service, in a mechanism, that automatically when you go there, you just do the same routine everywhere. Um, and that's where you can see why, in terms of my hypothesis of the trade return, why it needs to go into enforcement is that there's currently like 10 over pilots and different ways of trade return mechanisms in nationwide. So every time when you go to a food court or a location or even hawker centre, you have to learn, okay, how to return the tray here. How does it look like? Where is it? It's very confusing. It's creating inconvenience to people, right? People will not automatically learn. What is it for them? I mean, you give them 50 cents rebate. It's just 50 cents, right? To them, it maybe it doesn't even give them a cup of tea or whatever. Um, so if you really want to make it where it's unconscious, it needs to be the same way everywhere you go. 
And I thought the trolley one is quite successful, except, of course, I understand there is still trolleys lying here and there. <laughs> But yes, sort of reduced. Lah. Yes. So, so, so it's clear that even in something like uh, infrastructural design or service design, one needs to be constantly innovative. And, and to sum up, the longer term solution for Singapore, no single one intervention can actually achieve what we want, which is a truly clean city. And that is a, a, a comprehensive and sustained multifaceted approach uh, is needed so that the whole country can come together. Okay, now let's hear from some of the Singaporeans that we have interviewed on the street. What are their thoughts about keeping Singapore clean? We went to Taipei City to see how they are coping and how their culture would embrace cleanliness. We went to see the government initiatives, the schools and the community. We are here for holidays and surprisingly, that we find Taiwan is really a very clean place. It's much more cleaner than Singapore. We hardly can find the dustbin all around in Taiwan. Yeah, they, they have the initiative to actually keep the rubbish themselves. Ah, binning their own rubbish. We've all heard so many stories about that as well as what happens in Japan as well. Um, I know Sandra, your survey also addresses that. Uh, a huge percentage. Did you reveal the number? No, we are still validating between the results. Right, yeah, right. But right. safe to say that a majority of Singaporeans, at least via the survey, say that they do bin their trays. Okay. Is there any figure like, like you know, Prof, what kind of majority are we looking at b b before the whole place is flooded? Do we need, uh, 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 you know, is there any way that we know what is the percentage of people or you only need a small group to litter before the whole place is flooded? We are talking about uh, how to capture, right? Uh, whether people are littering or not littering, whether they have the habits or not, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's really hard because you, you can't do a survey because when you do a survey, uh, this, it involves self-reporting, you know, and nobody will ever say that, you know, I litter, you know, I'm a habitual litter, you know? Uh, but having said that, I mean, being a survey researcher myself, I would say that there are ways and means of crafting a survey questionnaire that enable you to try to get as close as possible. Uh, I don't think it's perfect. Uh, I think the perfect method will, of course, be using a lot of CCTV, right? And uh, actually observing them, you know? Uh, but that would be uh, maybe not always practical, uh, costly, in order to capture uh, uh, these people. So, um, I mean, I would still say that a survey, I mean, I'm, I'm in a way contradicting myself, but I think a survey can actually do the job, but don't expect 100% uh, accuracy. I think Sandra will agree with me as well, as well right? Uh, so it can still be done. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm like a broken <laughs> down no, no, no record. So, and so I keep saying, saying that you know, the best way is still that people must be responsible for mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. you know, and self-policing. Uh, that's the most effective. Uh, you have all kinds of CCTV around and there will still be people doing it. Uh, you know, uh, because it has to come from inside, not from outside, you know, uh, there is the pressure coming from outside. But what we need is the, the, the motivation that comes from the motivation that comes from the inside. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, let's take a look now at what some Singaporeans have to say. Uh, I think it's everyone's responsibility. Uh, we are just a country with many well-mannered uh, people, and uh, we are very civil citizens. So I think it's all it's everyone's responsibility to do so. Yes, I think to have 59,000 cleaners is not an ideal number, although I think it has evolved naturally to respond to the needs of the environment and the society. I think ultimately the hope will be to have a new generation of young people who will eventually grow up to be adults such that they take that personal responsibility to be clean. Uh, I think as a parent, it's very important for what they see, what the parents are doing because we are the role model to them. So if we clean our tables after we are eating, if we um, throw our be uh, litters well, you know, they see and they will do like what you know, monkey see, monkey do, right? <laughs> so 
So changing mindsets with the younger generation. I think that is the big fat million dollar question. I'll share a quick story before I share a very interesting video with you. And that is uh, when I was in Japan a few years ago, uh, we, we, we noticed that of course it was very clean and all that. So out of curiosity, I asked uh, a friend of mine who's married to a Japanese lady, I asked her, how do you do, the, do this? How do you teach your children to keep the country clean? And she says that in kindergarten, when the kids go to kindergarten, the main focus of kindergarten is to teach them how to become human beings. Basically, they teach manners. They teach manners. For example, if you are sitting on the MRT train and your little baby wants to step on the seats to look out of the train, she said, oh, we can't do that because you may not leave any trash on the seat, but you would soil the place for the next person, and that's not, not the right thing to do. Uh, and and I, was, I was really, really in awe of that, and hence my vision of a truly clean Singapore is one where citizens are considerate. And I think that, that should take care of a lot of things, okay? Any thoughts, no? Uh, okay. So the work that I do uh, as the co-founder of Fitri, so I didn't ex exactly explain, but Fitri is uh, an Islamic environmental group. Um, and one of the uh, core messages that we want to put out there is that in, in our religion itself, teaches us to be um, stewards of the earth and that we are not to um, cause corruption on earth. So the it's part of our being as, as not just Muslims, but as humans, that we actually take care of our environment, including not to litter, because we are actually making sure that you know, it's livable for everybody. Um, and so the kind of campaigns that we do, we actually reach out to kids. Um, a few years ago, we have a lot of programs with madrasas and mosques, kindergartens. Um, and then eventually we move on to like the messaging on our social media where uh, more uh, a larger crowd would know and um, yeah, realize this. Apparently, it's not very well known in our community that it's actually part of our religion to be clean. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful message, stewards of the environment. Okay, let's take a look now at a short video clip of how the school children in Taipei City do it. How do they keep their environments clean and hygienic? Uh, 每一个人对环境环保的概念都相当的清楚，但也知道说地球只有一个。那每个人呢，透过很缜密的规划，从资源回收、从厨余回收，还有环境的整理跟打扫，都尽一份心力。And they kept saying that really is good intention is not the same as action. It is about you really have to do something then you can't share, you actually feel it. And only when you feel it, then you want to do more. They classify the litter that they collected into recyclable, into the various bins. And when you have to sort out the rubbish into the different components for recycling, you're more conscious of what you're doing, and therefore you reduce the amount of waste you generate. There are no cleaners in the school, we clean the school ourselves. We segregate the plastic, paper and bottles. And I'm sure later on in their life, after they leave school, they will be very mindful about environmental issues. Wow, presumably the little boy who said there are no cleaners, he is an exchange student from Singapore. So, out of curiosity, if we have no cleaners in our schools, what do you think will happen? clean up after themselves, right? Okay. They have to learn that it's actually, nobody's going to do it for you or you're going to, you know, be responsible for it too. I think all the parents might complain. <laughs> <laughs> complain about what specifically? Uh, uh, how come I, I'm paying money to send my child to school and they're not getting the best form of environment? So in that sense also, um, I pay for it, therefore I should get the best in service, that kind of mentality. Including a cleaning service. Sandra. Including a cleaning service. I actually think that it might actually work. It will still be clean because the students or the, especially in primary to secondary, they have been taught to actually do weekly rostering cleaning, um, especially within their classroom compound, which actually the cleaners doesn't really go in. So cleaners really just do outside in terms of public compound, the field area and all those. So I do believe it will still be clean. But what if we stop cleaners outside of school? I think that's a more important question. 
Mm, okay. So, so the million dollar question is, why is it that, and, and this is raised every single time we talk about the trade return issue, and that is in schools we know to bin all our dirty plates. How is it that somehow when you get out of school and after army, people forget to do that? Prof, what, what would be your response to that? Well, it boils down to the idea of uh, reinforcement. It has to be reinforced everywhere. Uh, and not just because someone is looking at you, you know, you're under some kind of surveillance, then you do it, right? Uh, I think cleanliness is really about, uh, even when no one is looking, and you still do it, you know, you don't need someone to, to look over your shoulder before you practice it. Uh, so reinforcement all the way through. Uh, it doesn't have to be punitive, but it has to be uh, uh, sort of consistent and uh, maybe even encouraging. Uh, yes, go for it, ladies. So maybe to add on, right, I think to what Prof is saying, I think it's about the consistency. So if we really look at the environment and infrastructure that we live in, we only, we know our kids, basically, they clean in school. But when they're at home, do they clean in school? No. Basically, they have other people to clean on their behalf. And then same, when I actually, even we go to workforce, do we actually clean after ourselves? Do, is there still cleaners within our work compound? There is. So imagine if we can actually dis instill the same actions from school to workforce to all the way wherever your home environment is, mm. I think that's consistency. But that's not very practical, is it? I mean, considering that we are talking about raising productivity, considering that uh, we have uh, uh, PMETs who may be paid a lot of money and their time can be better used than, for example, cleaning up the pantry. So is that a challenge to how we can reinforce that message? I do take your point, uh, Prof and Sandra, that along the way, it doesn't mean that when you are young, you lay the foundation, things will continue in autopilot. Clearly, it doesn't. Then the question is, how do we reinforce that? Uh, it, it into adulthood as well. I wanted to jump on that because, um, you know, when we talk about changing mindsets of the future generation, it's also changing, you know, how as we progress in our different livelihoods. So I really took to the point because kids, um, right now, right, we know people, PMETs, people are, have no time to even keep their house clean, so they hire helpers to help them take care. And therefore, when the child comes back, they expect everything to be done for them. This is uh, compared to my friend in Australia when she relocated from Singapore to Australia. She did all the household by herself because, you know, the work balance, the work life did allow her support to spend time and manage the house. Um, even the, uh, not just women, sorry, even men as well. So does it, does it go back to a structural point where how our society runs in the sense that, you know, we're all so busy. Do we, it's not a priority to us. And like what Tony said, it's an outsourced business. But we really need to rethink of this model and whether it should be the foundation of what a Singaporean identity is. Yes, it is a big policy uh, question because, I mean, the domestic helpers, for example, they exist because families need help. Uh, especially for uh, double household incomes. They need help with the elderly, they need help with the kids. So, so it is a really big question. Uh, uh, but Tony, I know you have something to say. Well, on your point about the PMET, I think we are not expecting the, the office worker to, to scrub his carpet around his work desk or to clean up the pantry. No, I think the, the, the idea is not to leave a trail behind you. Right? So, uh, Wash your own mug, for example, bin your own litter, take your trash bins to the collection point. So do not leave a trail where our cleaners have to go and pick up after them. Let our cleaners take care of the jobs, like taking care of cobwebs, uh, vacuuming the carpets. Leave that to the cleaners, but do not leave your own trail behind. Let, let me get back to the cleaners in the next segment. We will come to the cleaning workforce uh, in a bit, but let, let's, for now, let's just stay on the, the educating the, 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 the kids. So my question is, is it enough that the schools nurture and inculcate individual as well as community responsibility? What else needs to be done? I think going back to the same point, right? I think the actions has to be true. So, so I think on to what Tony just said. It's not about the heavy cleaning. It's about washing the marks that you, you, the things that you eat, throw to the dustbins. And if you can instill that from young mm. to workforce to home, why not? Like, I wouldn't get my helper to basically throw rubbish, right? I would still force my kids, you have rubbish to throw, throw it in the dustbin. Her job is to clean, is to throw away the garbage that's collected. 
Her job is to clean the toilets. Her job is to clean the, the, the bigger stuff, right? So, so it's the smaller stuff that we can instill that can be added throughout the whole process. And if that's done, it's actually done really automatically and very routinely. Then we won't see the small little litters that's gathering around. I think that will be actually really effective. What role do parents play? Well, I think certainly parents have a big role to play. Parents have a big role to play, right? Because they themselves must believe in it. You know, by not reinforcing, they are basically saying that, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. You need to do it when you have to in school. But when you're at home, forget about it. It's okay, right? So the values have to be consistently applied and parents have to be, actually, they themselves must be convinced about that. Uh, actually, I have another point, right? Which is that earlier you mentioned about productivity, right? Maybe a cleaner environment, office space, uh, office environment actually may contribute to productivity. You know, uh, you know, sometimes when you go to a place where it's so messy, right, and, and you, you find that you can't retrieve things that you want because they're in the middle of somewhere, you know, some, some of the mess. So, so maybe, I mean, just maybe that there is a, a, a connection, you know, between a clean office environment and productivity. So why not? Sorry, talking about offices. So in my previous office, right, we had a hot desking space. So, you know, and the dustbin, there's no dustbin per table. So I found that really effective because when you leave, right, you have to take everything with you. So in that sense, you also won't really leave litter behind. You actually walk the dustbin and throw it in. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was actually a very triggering point of how much litter I actually had because of the stuff I had to carry around. And I thought that mentality was very good because, you know, we talk about educating for the, for the generation. So we have, uh, cleaning in schools up to JC, university, maybe we forget it a bit, but in workplaces, we, this starts to get reinforced again. And it's that reinforcement that I feel is missing. Like what I mentioned, right? What happens along the way? How come halfway maybe we become very nonchalant towards litter? So yeah, I, I thought that was a good... Um, I think way. education, educating is not just what you say, but what you actually do, you know, uh, setting an example for, for people around you, for your children. Clearly, in the example of the Taiwanese ki kids, they were able, they practiced it, and they actually do it in, on a regular basis. To a point when I think that when once it's very visceral, and you actually touch the, the trash, you pick it up yourself. I think there is that awareness that oh wow, there's this much trash I'm producing, or there's this much um, thing, there's this much things that we need to do. So there's a connection that's that's put out there, right? And so it becomes more. Uh, relatable for them when they grow up. I don't know if you noticed, but in the video, right, they actually segmented the trash into different types like paper, plastic liners. So when you look at it in totality, you're like, wow, I did this. It looks so clean. It looks so nice. Versus I think if you look at 10 trash bags that are like smelly because it's co-mingled and it's not managed, I feel that, you know, you also have that kind of sense of pride. Yeah, I think we are talking about multiple objectives, right? Cleanliness is one, yes. and recycling, recycling is and environment, one. right? So we're actually doing a lot. Mm. Just so, so I think Sam's point. Really waste, right? Yeah, Sam's point is that when, when it's segregated and sorted out properly, it looks less uh, maybe daunting, and it's not so dirty, and maybe it's easier to approach. I'll tell you what I'm concerned about. When we tell a child, please wash your cup, for example, please wipe the table when you are done. But when the child says, why? I think the question is, the answer is really, really important because why do I need to wash my cup? At home, I have auntie to do it for me, right? In school, I just have to put it in the bin ma, then another auntie or uncle will go and wash it. So why do I need to do it? How do we answer a child when they say why? Why do I need to keep the, my table clean? Does anyone have any answer? <laughs> I don't have an answer. I'm a mom, so I still, I still struggling with the answer. I'm your mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, by stopping about themselves, right? So, so I usually force them to do their own mini housework, like what you just said, mm. when the auntie is on leave. So it's basically every Sunday. Right. Um, and and that's why I say because auntie is not here. So if you're not washing, who's going to do it? It's not me. I wash my own plates. I clean up myself. Mm. So you have to do the same. Isn't that what your school have been also telling you as well? Yeah. So, so when, when, when I was very young, my mom used to tell me that when, you, when I tell you to do something, you do it and don't create problems for other people. Don't create. It sticks in my head. I was too young. I never asked her, but why is wrong with creating problems with other people? Maybe we, we never had helpers and therefore I wouldn't think that someone is going to cover my back. So I, I think the tone that parents set when the children are very, very young, uh, 
Unfortunately, in our society, it still remains the mother, the, care, the, the main caregiver. The tone that mom or dad sets is really important. So when, when I tell the children, for example, my son, you know, I asked him to wash a plate. Oops. <laughs> I asked him to wash a plate. I said, half a bottle of detergent. And then when he finished washing the plate, the whole area is messier than before. So I said, oops, you, if you create the mess, I'm afraid you need to clean it up. So the less mess you create when you are washing the plate, the less what you have to do. Because don't leave that problem to the person behind you. Does it come from a place of empathy? Because I no exactly. kids, no exactly. kids. But for me, if I if I had a, if I had a child, I would tell them, look, auntie is already working six days a week. She has a huge workload. She has to take care of six people. So in a sense, also building empathy in children to tell them that you know you doing this act will also release the burden of someone else. That was just um, what I was thinking as well. Well, let's uh, hit the streets again to hear what some Singaporeans have to say. I think it, it's a bit of a mixed responsibility. Lah. So we can't just leave it to the, to the, on the hands of the cleaners. I think as Singaporeans, if you don't keep the environment around you clean, then you'll just end up being in a dirty country. So I think everyone has a role to play to keep the country clean. Yeah, I think they're doing more than enough, honestly, because um, most of the cleaners are very old and they're really trying their best to help us clear our rubbish and all. Okay, right now I think we rely a lot on the human uh, manpower to get this done. Uh, if we could move towards uh, in AI or you know robotic cleaners, which I think has already started in some of the hawker centers or coffee shop so I think that would be much better yeah rather than relying on uh, human human manpower especially the old aunties and uncles it's very poor thing to see them cleaning after us let me use that to segue Tony into talking about the cleaners do you think there is enough empathy towards the cleaning the, the, the cleaning industry cleaners in Singapore I, I think uh, equal half um, I think there are some quarters of our society that are, show a lot of empathy. They, they, they think that they are doing a good job, something that they do not want to do. But on the other hand, there are some quarters that uh, would want to test our cleaners huh? on what they do. Okay. Right? So some, would, uh, some office workers would deliberately put a dated piece of paper underneath the trash bin to check if the cleaner actually removed the trash bin and cleared the paper. Uh, it also happens in the housing estates. Um, they put dated newspaper at a certain corner of the staircase or maybe the corridor and, and they check uh, if the paper has been cleaned. So I think that's not fair. Um, uh, we are trying hard. We are facing a lot of manpower issues and, and, and there's no need to test our integrity that way. Do you think people actually, I, I mean the rest of you can talk, do, are they really testing or it's just an excuse? I really need to give this example because uh, I often moderate dialogue in our cleanup chat and uh, I think just two weeks ago someone I was saying thank you um, this contractor for cleaning because I do send pictures to show the work they do. Someone said, um, no, why should we be thanking them? That is their duty. So they are for doing the scope that's intended for them to do so there's no need to thank them. And I just like, oh my goodness, you know, there are still people. And um, following on to Tony's point, right, I see people intentionally throw the litter there and then complain saying that this banana peel has been there for six days. Why is no one picking it up? I was like, why don't you do it, right? It's not easy and, and, you know, it's very challenging because we are still facing mindsets like this to this day. And it's not just the younger generation, I would say. Okay, I, 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 um, I'm hoping that it's a small segment of society that behaved that way. But Prof, would you have any explanation at all for why people do that? Well, I, I think all these stories are, of course, interesting. And I think uh, we, we, we should take note of them, right? Uh, but I, and I also believe that people should feel outraged that there are such people. Uh, but as I said earlier, right, fortunately, I think the proportion of people who are like that is actually quite small. But their story gets, you know, sort of, uh, it goes viral, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and therefore, everybody knows about those kind of stories. Um, we can learn from those stories, uh, but let's, con let's still be optimistic. You know, we should not because of a few of these bad heads and think that, oh, you know, mm. we're in trouble. Uh, I don't think we're in trouble. I think we, there's still room for optimism. Uh, 
uh, but we need to, of course, address this small segment of the population. But they have also raised a, a, a question, which is, and I find this common, especially because of the trade return and enforcement which just started. People ask me, does that mean that we will need to reduce the number of cleaners at hawker centres? Since I'm already returning everything on my own. Tony, how would you take that question? Okay, let, me, let me start uh, from the numbers. Uh, I have mentioned earlier the industry is grappling with uh, manpower shortages. And... Um, there are just not enough workers to go around. There are many reasons for that. Uh, I mentioned a few just now about demographics and all that. The image and perception of a job in the industry is not glamorous. Um, it only appeals to the aged, maybe the less well-educated, and nobody aspires to be a cleaner, you know, basically. So, and, and, and some uh, look at it as a job of last resort. So they don't want to be clean unless they have to. Uh, also, uh, locals are also demanding. They do not want to do long hours. They, they want to uh, uh, work shorter hours. They don't take on laborious work and all that. And uh, post-COVID, or rather during, during this period, uh, there are travel restrictions. So our access to foreign workers are also curtailed which further adds to the manpower crunch issues. Right? So, so we have a manpower problem. So to answer your question, uh, no, every cleaner that's available is very, very important. Right? In the hawker centre, if they do not have to collect the trays, they can be redeployed elsewhere within the hawker centre to do other tasks through probably job redesign. If not, they can be easily absorbed into other premises that needs them. So, there is no question about cleaners losing their job. This myth must be defunct, debunked. Sorry. You, you, you mentioned earlier on that the cleaning industry has an image problem. But it is not just an image problem, is it? Because the truth of the matter is, you are frontliners. You, are, you have to handle dirty things. So besides trying to change the image, which you know, a good image consultant or public relations person can do over a period of time, but besides that, what else is the industry doing, for example, in terms of uh, making the job actually safer, redesigning, automation, for example? Example. Yeah, very important is the dollar and cents. So uh, we ought to pay our cleaners uh, to a level that will be attractive to more people, which we have uh, achieved recently through the progressive wage model, which we have successfully uh, implemented. So cleaners' wages will be substantially increased from 2023. Um, you are right. You pointed out about uh, technology. We are. Uh, taking steps, or rather a lot of, a lot of uh, service providers have taken steps to mechanize wherever possible, automate, introduce robots where possible, and digitalize. And also uh, look into process engineering to make sure work is done safer and easier. So some people may say, use robots, use machines, clean meh. How would you respond to that? Technology is always moving. So things are always improving. We may not be there yet, but let's move along. At the moment, I would say a machine or robot can do 65-70% of a, a, a human a job. Uh, it's, it's not 100%. The human still needs to touch up, but it's improving. Yes, We will get there. So, so I think the pandemic has put a spotlight on the importance of a cleaner's job. So because of the pandemic, we have also read stories about how people are saying, you know, I really want to be a nurse or I really want to be a doctor because it's put the focus on helping to treat people. But do you think it will also throw a spotlight on cleaners to say, see how important her job is cleaning the railing? If not, when you go on the escalator, you cannot hold. Will that do the same to cleaners? How do young people think? about the cleaning industry. I um, just want to bring a story about like, uh, how it was like for me back in JC. Uh, back in junior college, there was uh, an opening for internships and law firms and uh, all these other interesting, you know, high-profile kind of jobs. Uh, technically, what you will be doing as a, an intern would probably be to bring coffee or something like that. Nothing too fancy because you're only a JC student. Uh, but one girl, uh, my friend, um, it was very interesting when she brought up about cleaning. She herself said that you know what, I actually want to be the best cleaner out there. And I've never heard a person, a young person, talk about 
the cleaning industry or cleaners in the same way that she did. And it was pretty inspiring because I think the her, her view on of this kind of vocation is that it's an honorable job and you can be the best person um, for that and that you know it's a skill that you can pick. So there is this... Uh, it just highlighted to me the underlying biases that we have towards mm. certain vocations, certain jobs. Um, certain skills are lower skills, um, not you know as as interesting as being a lawyer or a doctor. Mm. When actually they 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 are frontliners, like you said, they're very important and they they can do a good job and ensure that we can live better lives. Yep. Pass her contact to Tony. Yeah. I would yes, have. <laughs> He's the she president probably, of Emax. <laughs> yeah, she would probably be a boss of something now. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm just going to bring this to a closing, Tony, by giving you the last uh, question, and that is, how would you how would you encourage young people to look at the cleaning industry in a different way? I'm talking about young people, people who are still in school, for example. I think they need to recognize that we are playing an important role in the society. We are uh, keeping the environment clean and in today's context, we are also keeping the environment hygienic. Um, and, and this is a frontline job, very close to what uh, probably healthcare workers do and they ought to recognize that and probably give them the due respect. All right. On that note, I want to thank each and every one of you for sharing your thoughts and your perspectives and your time this afternoon. Well, thank you for joining us at today's Facebook Live event. Uh, just a quick wrap up. Personally, I think there needs to be a greater ownership towards public spaces and cleanliness so that in the years ahead, our future generation can enjoy a clean city and not just a cleaned one. Let's not wait for another piece of legislation to be introduced before change can happen. Stay safe, stay clean.